Okay, welcome to part two. The first thing I want to do to our terminal here is add a scroll rect. This is going to allow us to scroll through our terminal messages when the size of the actual command line container grows to be larger than that of the screen or than that of its container. So in order for this to work, we have to add a scroll rect to the terminal object here and then drag in the rect transform from the command line container. We don't want horizontal scrolling since it's a, a terminal, they usually don't have horizontal scrolling. Movement type we will change to clamped. Elastic will make it bouncy. Unrestricted will allow us to scroll um, pretty much anywhere that we want, but neither of those are very terminal-like in their behavior. Deceleration rate is fine. We can change that later to our taste, um, but we'll up the scroll sensitivity to about 50. Now we're going to add a mask. And all that's going to do is hide any command lines that go outside of the um, container. You won't really notice this much if your terminal is the same size as your screen or if it takes up the entire size of the screen but if you have a smaller terminal you'll want to add a mask to hide the command lines as you scroll around. Lastly I'm just going to grab these um, sample directory lines, sample response lines, and the user input lines because in the last episode I forgot to change their background to none. Now, it's not super important but it just makes things a little bit cleaner. So now that we have all of that cleaned up We'll go into our assets folder and create a new folder for prefabs. And I'm going to drag in this sample directory line, make it a prefab, and the sample response line and make that a prefab. So we will now come over to our UI and we will add a new script and call it terminal manager. Or you can just call it terminal, whatever you prefer. Once the script is added, we will open it up in Visual Studio. Wonderful. Let's delete all of this. And the first thing we want to do is just get a bunch of references to some of the important things in our terminal. So this will include public game object for the directory line, public game object, and the response line. These are going to be for references to our prefabs so that we can instantiate them at any time. And we also want a reference to the input field, which we will call the terminal input. We want a reference to the actual entire um, user input line, a reference to the scroll rec because we will want to dynamically scroll as we actually enter in commands, and the command line container itself which we will call our message list. Feel free to name these variables whatever you like. I have strange variable naming conventions. The method that we will create in order to manage uh, GUI events is just called uh, private void on GUI. Now here we will add in a little bit of logic so that we can know when our user is interacting with the terminal. So we'll say if that terminal input that we got a reference to is focused and the text within it actually says something and at that same point on that same frame if the user hits enter then we can do some stuff here so when this happens we want to store whatever the user typed in a variable called user input to get that we reference our terminal input um, type and we grab its text. Then 
I'll just write a comment here saying store whatever the user typed. And we want to clear the input field because if the user hit enter, we want to remove uh, what it wrote, but we now have what they wrote in memory so we can do some stuff with it. So we'll make a method here called clear input field. We'll just come down here and write void clear input field. And so we want to reference our terminal input and say terminal input dot text is equal to an empty string. So as stated in the sort of introductory video that I did for this series, after the user types something and presses enter, it stays there. And so what we need to do is to instantiate whatever the user typed um, in a directory line in order to sort of simulate that appearance to make it look like something stayed there as we add more game objects. So instantiate a game object with a directory prefix. So we will make a method here called add directory line. We'll come down here. The first thing that we need to do in this add directory line method is to get the size of the message list and store it in a vector2 variable. The reason for this is as we get more and more command lines, the size of our container is going to have to grow accordingly in order for the scroll, scroll rec to scroll appropriately. If you don't scale it, you'll get very strange behavior with your scroll rec. So this is the message list of get component type rect transform. Oops. And we want the size delta. Then we will say message list of get component rect transform size delta new vector to message list size dot x because it's not going to grow horizontally so are we having namespace conflicts but it will grow vertically and we set our height of our lines to be 30 with a padding or spacing of 5 in our vertical layout group so we need to add 35 pixels each time. I need to remove this from my namespace. So this basically is just resizing the command line container. So the scroll rec doesn't throw a fit. So then we want to actually instantiate the directory line. So we will say game object message equals instantiate the directory line. And we want to set this thing's parent to the command line container, which we've called message list uh, transform. To make sure that it goes to the bottom of the list of children of the command line container, uh, we want to set its child index. So we grab this game object that we just instantiated, we access its transform, and we say set sibling index. Now we want to basically get the command line container child count, all of its children, and subtract one from that in order to set its index to the last child. Then we want to set the text of this new game object. So we will once again grab this thing that we just instantiated and we want to get components in children of type text. And now we have two of these text components in our directory line. This would be index zero and this would be index one. 
we want to change the user input text, not the directory text. And so I'm going to say at one dot text is equal to user input, that string that we stored earlier. Obviously, we're going to have to pass this into our method. So we can say string user input. So I've come back into Unity here. And before we can test it out, we have to make sure that we actually do all of our assignments. And so we have all of these fields that we need to assign. If we open up our prefabs folder, we can drag in the sample directory line and the sample response line. The terminal input itself is this input field. The whole user input line is the user input line. The scroll rect resides on the terminal and the message list is the command line container. Now these, and we will try it out, test. Line is instantiated. However, we are getting some strange behavior now where this is remaining up here. Test again. You'll also notice that the scrolling is a little strange. Scrolling is strange. And that's because temporarily what we can do is grab our command line container and go from the bottom and set its height to be roughly the size of what we're doing here with a little bit extra and then re-anchor it We'll just quickly try this again. And there we go. So it's behaving closer to how a terminal behaves. This is a test. And there we go. So it's behaving closer to how a terminal behaves in its scrolling. But we need to now move this guy to be the very bottom. So let's go back into Visual Studio. And we also want to move the user input line to the end. So I can do this by saying user input line dot transform dot set as last sibling. Now this is an equivalent way to achieve what I did before where you take the child count and you subtract one. It's just another way to do it. I'm just showing you that uh, you can get the child count that way and, and dynamically set um, the order of the children. Now it would be nice if we could refocus the input line or the input field so that the user doesn't have to reselect um, that field every time they press enter. So the way we can do that is type terminal input dot activate input field terminal input dot select nice so let's try this out once more testing one two three and now we can see that when i press enter the line is instantiated and the input moves to the bottom and the input field is refocused we just have a little bit of an annoying thing here where there's a space. So to fix that, I believe I can come down to the input field text here, select the left and just hit zero. Save that, retry here. Test, yes, this works. Wonderful, wonderful. So that'll do it for now. In the next episode, we're going to write an interpreter script, which is actually going to look at what we wrote and then respond with something uh, accordingly.